Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last episode of Open World. Um, I'm here with Lari and Ale, and we are finishing this season on a high note. We have a very special guest today, Arthur Flew. We're so excited to have you with us. Thank you so much for coming. We are big fans of yours. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Uh, first off, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Arthur Flew. I've I've been doing localization for 17 plus years at this point. Um, most recently at Epic Games, uh, and then previous to that, I worked at Blizzard Entertainment. Nice. Oh, cool. Thank nice. you so much. How can you say that? I'm so chill. <laughs> <laughs> so <sorry. laughs> Thank you. This man's Arthur. back is like this, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, we wanted to start um, talking about cultural adaptation. And um, my first question is, can you share a specific instance where cultural adaptation led to unexpected but fantastic results in some of the iconic games that you work through the years? Um, yeah, I mean, I think generally you're always pleasantly surprised whenever you try something new, um, when you're doing localization. Um, but, uh, I think, uh, I think it's easy to sort of go through the motions of doing the same thing over and over again. And so, uh, whenever we have an opportunity to try something sort of out of the box, you never know how it's going to land. Um, so we had this one opportunity once where, um, uh, the the game I was working on decided to have some DJ radio station in the in the game, and um, you know the normal way about uh, the normal way to go about it would be to you know hire some local voice actors and have them record those same lines. Um, but uh, we decided to go a little bit um, extra on it and talk to the marketing teams in the regional uh, groups and things like that, and. See if we could actually find some local DJs for the different countries that we localize in, and um, trying to maintain sort of the same vibe and feel of what the English DJ was doing, but trying to adapt it more culturally for those for those countries. And it um, we found some either up and coming or just you know recently popularized DJs in every one of those countries and had them record, um, and it really gave those countries like a little bit more uh authenticity right authenticity um, that's the word that i was thinking yeah yeah it's and, authentic and exactly and and the djs really liked it and i think it really hit the the chord with all the 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 audience in those countries and it was a really good good experience everybody loved it and it was it was outside the norm we had to you know make all kinds of new contracts and work with them on you know what we could and couldn't do and what they and they couldn't do and all that kind of stuff, but it was it was I think a fun vibe for everybody. That is so cool. I love that's it. So and that's that's definitely what uh cultural adaptation is about at the end of the day. Like you want to connect with the different audiences and you know have a similar experience. If you had a DJ in your original language, it would be like it's just so cool that everyone had the same experience, like different countries. So it's really really yeah. cool. Yeah. It, yeah, it was with a fun, the rise of experience. Yeah, with the rise of diverse voices in gaming, how do you approach inclusivity within localization? Because, I mean, I think this is very related to what you're saying right now. Um, like having diverse voices uh, to approach these different cultures, I think that's amazing. Yeah, it's um, it's always an interesting topic when you, when you try to do inclusivity. Uh, obviously, from a cultural standpoint, you really want to try to be as authentic as possible. So where you can... You know, you don't try to do a straight adaptation of the content. You try to make it make sense for the region you're adapting it to. But even more so, like, um, not even just cultural adaptation, but um, uh, LGBTQT plus adaptations and things like that. Um, it's a bit harder for some languages than others. Um, 
you know, some some cultures are are less inclined to support that kind of content. Yeah. But where we can, we try to do that do that stuff while staying true to the source material, right? We don't want to rewrite the original content, but um, try to adapt things so that it that it fits and works for that culture. Um, but yeah, it's it's even within the language itself, right? You look at a lot of the Latin-based languages, which have genders inside. Inside, this is this word is a masculine noun, this is a feminine noun. Try to figure out ways to kind of get around that, so it doesn't feel like we're injecting that stuff into the to the content um, using neutral pronouns things like that when we don't need to specify masculine, feminine, that kind of stuff. Um, my team at Epic was really good about that. That is really cool. It's it happened so many times that I like choose the feminine character and then the text in Spanish just is masculine, even though I <laughs> chose a feminine character. So like talking to me as if I was a, a boy. So yeah. It happens. Yeah, I've seen it. It's, Hopefully yeah, it's never happened in any game I've done. <laughs> no. No, don't worry about it. No, no. I, I I I really don't think so. I really, really, really don't think so. Um, so Arthur, beyond these um, things, right, that are uh, that really cater to to gamers of different identities from different places, you know, where accuracy is also involved. Um, you were talking about different things that you've tried uh, to make the some elements of the games pop. What do you consider to be the secret sauce to some really outstanding game localization? Maybe this is too much of a broad question, you know, but take it wherever you want it to be, wherever you want it to take it. Um, sure. So, um, you know, so accuracy is important, but I don't think it should be the sort of number one driving force behind the approach yeah. to localization. So, like, you want to be accurate, but you also want to adapt. Uh, you know, a, a, the easy example is a, an English joke may not land in in French, right? Or so you want to mm -hmm. try to figure out a way to make that joke have the same sort of feeling that that you would expect it to have. But um, beyond that, um, I, I, there's a couple things that I think are truly important when you are dealing with um, trying to localize content is. You want a team that really understands the source material. Um, you know, anybody can translate a sentence into another language, but if you really hone in on trying to understand what the, what the original source is trying to convey, you'll you'll get a better um, translation than you would otherwise. Um, so, like a good example would be like um, if you're trying to translate something sort of goofy, like cuddle team leader from Fortnite. You could take that in a lot of different directions um, in every language. And so you really want to try to hone in on what the source material was trying to do with it, find something that makes sense for those languages. Um, but the other, the other part of it that I think often gets overlooked is the tools, specifically the tool set that you're working out of. Um, a really good pipeline and functionality behind everything really makes or breaks what you can and cannot do with localization. So the flexibility inside the original product, um, you know, even things like allowing uh, gender tokens or allowing plural forms, all that stuff really determines whether or not you can provide a quality localized product. Um, and so a lot of a lot of times what ends up happening is you have a bare bones product from a from a localization standpoint it's just you have a string and you can localize it and so you will often find those situations like you described where you might have picked a female character but they only have the opportunity to write one version of a line so they default to male or something like that and so that flexibility needs to exist inside the product and i think it's an off, often overlooked aspect of localization yeah, absolutely. I like what you were what you were just saying is like a lot of the things are have to be considered in a previous stage, kind of like in the development yeah, stage. Yeah, not, not when it comes to localization. 
<laughs> you're like, what do I do with this? So this is like the perfect intro for my question. Like, have you ever encountered major ethical dilemmas while localizing and how did you navigate them with your team? That's a oh. great question. <laughs> Sorry, but that's a good one. Um, I, I don't think I've worked on a product that hasn't had ethical dilemmas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's one of those things where they're they're often innocent like people who who are making the content or things like that don't they don't know everything about other cultures i yeah i don't pretend to know everything about other cultures um yeah. and so you know they'll build something and they think it's cool and then you know it comes to us and we take a look at it and we go ah, you know this is maybe not the best idea um and uh, you know it it's not that uncommon for it to happen. And so what, what we usually do when that comes across our plate is we take a look at it and we try to sort of uh, build a, a document explaining why this is a problem. If it's minor, it's something that we might just directly talk to whoever designed the content. Um, but if it's something more significant or we think it might have legal, legal repercussions or or significant impact on sales or something like that, then we would definitely um, uh, draft something up that we would then bring up as a as a concern um, to the team at large, and sort of try to find a solution from there. Um, and and usually it's resolved. It's a matter of discussing things. It's it, uh, the designer is usually not so gung ho about something that that you know that they wouldn't make changes to it. Um, and there's there's compromise that there are always to be found, right? Like. Um, uh, the only thing we need you to change is this little thing over here, and then the problem goes away because nobody's going to associate it with whatever it is. Um, but that's a great yeah, way to I, put it as well. Yeah, I, I, I think it's else. yeah, it's fairly common, and it's just a matter of discussing it with with the things. the The, the issue is if it's happen if it happens too late and it doesn't get caught and it goes live. Um, but thankfully, that that I think that's only happened sort of once uh, for us for me, long time ago on Diablo during beta, Diablo 3 during beta. Um, we hadn't noticed it, but uh, at some point, I guess, uh, the somebody had taken the uh, cover of the Quran and placed it as the cover of one of the books inside the game. And um, um, if you play Diablo, you can click on the bookshelves and all the books fall off yes. onto the floor and, and you can't yeah. have the Quran on the floor. So right. that caused a little bit of an uproar, um, and it was fixed uh, as soon as we were notified. But that's something that, like, sometimes they'll slip through the crack. Now, to be fair, when the books fall on the ground, they're like this. Yep. Very, very yeah. small. So yep. it's that that's having a, a quite a keen eye for detail. And for sure, the artist didn't realize that he had grabbed the cover of a Quran either, right? So it was it was completely an innocent mistake that innocent. happened to to fall through the cracks. But yeah. since then, you know, we put things in place to make sure those types of things don't happen. <laughs> nice. That is really, really, really interesting. And I think that's also cool, kind of like to talk about more for because, like you said, a lot of times it's like. Most of the times, it's not even, you know, intentional. So, just to be, uh, if the if the like, um, culturalization is taken into account uh, beforehand, it's always good. Um, so thank you for for that. And now I wanted to ask, um, kind of change topics here and introduce the the metaverse. So, uh, um, I know you've worked in this. Like developing concept of the metaverse and i was curious about like what's your vision about it do you think it's something that will be localized like how do you envision that happening um so the metaverse is interesting uh i, I i'm going to preface this by saying that i have no idea uh, what shape or form the metaverse will ultimately take. And I think anything can happen between now and that day, should it ever happen, uh, that could dramatically alter the course of things. So, um, but it, 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 in my opinion, and I, I'm no engineer, I'm not, a, I'm not a professional in this space, but in my opinion, I think like the technology of today 
or the near future wouldn't necessarily allow us to build a world that millions of people can be in at the same time. So I, I would expect something where we have like, you know, worlds within a platform that exists um, that can be thematic. Um, something like, you know, this is the Japan world or this is the Star Wars world or this is the... Um, I will be there. <laughs> yeah, the, the Nike world or whatever. If you, make it, and, you can find me there. <laughs> yeah. And so... If you um, build it, they will come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so you'd have these... Uh, like, I don't know if you saw Ready Player One, but I think they do something similar yeah. where they have a yeah. world for like the school and a world for like, you know, uh, gaming places and blah, blah, blah. So I think sort of that idea is probably the most immediately achievable uh concept of the world and um and, and as far as whether or not we localize it i i think yes i think the answer to that is yes but i think that um it, it's gonna take a few different approaches um and i don't think that one solution to encompass the entire thing makes sense right so like if as an example if 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 the government of Japan had decided that they wanted to make a replica of Tokyo inside this world to allow people to come visit Tokyo for whatever reason. Um, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense to localize all the signs in the streets and, and things like that. Like you want that authenticity for, yeah. for the people that are going there. And, uh, but I could see something like, um, you know, an overlay where like you look at a sign and there's some kind of translation that pops up over it or some that optional for you if you wanted to, to actually understand what you were seeing. Um, so I could see that making sense. Um, but if you're if you're looking at a, a, a Star Wars world or something like that, I think that you would want to localize um, yeah. and make that experience more um, uh, I guess, inclusive of all the different cultures that are out there. Um, and I think, like, if you look at something like that, it's absolutely way too much. If if you're building a, a platform that anybody at any time could submit content to and prop up a world, there's no way one single entity can try to localize all of that, right? Like, it's just too much. So I, I think that um sort of similar to how if you want to put out a content on sony the playstation or microsoft xbox you have to submit the localization for it um i would expect something similar to that where like nike wants to put out a nike building where you can go in and look at all the different shoes that you can buy from nike um that that they would supply whatever localization is that they want and there'd be certain requirements right. that that the platform would have uh, like number of languages or, you know, uh, no cuss words and blah, 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 whatever it is. Um, but that they would supply it and it would maybe go through a round of QA or things like that to make sure everything looks okay, just like any other content submission platform. But but yeah, that's sort of what I would expect where um, the, the, the people making the content would provide the localization and there could be an option of hiring providers that that whoever makes the metaverse uh to help localize it as well but um but yeah that's sort of how i i imagine it working that makes that makes sense yeah this mm -hmm. is it's it's such a it's such a fascinating topic honestly because like you said we know we don't know like what's going to look like in a few years um but it sure will be very interesting to see what happens. Yeah. And if you find out like some kind of metaverse world about Star Wars coming in, please <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> but, like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so beyond video games, what other forms of media or artistic expression do you think will benefit from your unique localization expertise? Um hmm. uh, so so for me, um, I this this may sound a little weird, but I I think localization as sort of like a, a solution has been solved, 
in a lot of ways. Like we know how to take a file and localize it and give it back. Like that's not a complicated process. Um, uh, what I really enjoy is solving the pipeline of localization, like like under, like going to the roots of like, hey, we have this product, we want to localize it. How do we get the product in a way that makes sense to get localized um, and make it easy for the people to do that actual work? Um, that's what I really enjoy ultimately out of the out of the work. Um, so uh, it's. It's not so much about like the content for me, I guess, as much as it is the technology and and trying to figure out ways we can make that that better. And for me, something like the metaverse would be a super interesting challenge. Something like AR, I think, would be super interesting. Um, to try to solve like how do we overlay content in on the real world without it being annoying. Um, that kind of stuff to me is super interesting. I, uh, I'm not to say like, you know, a movie or TV stuff wouldn't be interesting, but like it's it's a solved problem, right? It's, it's the, the problem is the volume, right? Like how do you tackle so much content and get it back in time? But that's, you know, more hours or more time. Pick which one. You get, yeah. You get it's that. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, for me, it's the technology. It's finding ways to make lives easier for everybody, finding solutions. I love that. Cool. Yeah, I love I that. Like. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and especially AR. I mean, AR really, I mean, VR, we all love the VR thing. I, I get dizzy on a personal note. But the, the AR thing, I think that once it explodes, once it's done, like, just right, mm -hmm. And there are many companies that are really uh, aiming to towards that. Uh, I'm looking forward to what's going to come in. I don't know. I, I wanted I, to I, say five years, but even a year from now. It, see, for me, like I've tried the VR headsets and I've tried, like I've looked at this new, the, the new Apple Vision Pro or whatever yeah. they call it. I, I don't remember, but like um, they're still too big. And they still require you to have cables and oh my god, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And it's, and it's like, like the initial, the initial cell phones, right? Thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I need it. it to get to a point where it's literally like my glasses. Yeah, That's exactly. What I want. Yeah, and then the day that happens, I think it blows up. Like if I don't need to carry around like this heavy headset, if I can just put oh my, my glasses on. And I think Google announced like years ago this Google Glass thing, which is yes. supposed to be like yes, they did. A tiny they, thing they, and... they 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 didn't. But it failed because that, yeah, society was not ready for it at the no. moment. It was <laughs> just like no. <laughs> you know what I want? I want to go like Aloy. You know, like yeah, the focus. Ah, that would be cool Aloy's too. focus. Yeah. Well, like, you're asking way too much, bro. We're just asking for glasses. <laughs> okay, with the glasses. With the glasses. He's taking further yeah. into the future, kind of like when we are grandparents. Hey, and... ten, 10 years from now, <laughs> for my kid. Um, but, that, but that's what I want. I, I want it to be simple, right? Like, And I think the public at large is waiting for that, right? Like, it needs to make sense for people to walk around with these things. And until that happens, I don't think these things are really going to take off. They're cool, but they're not mess massively popular until then um Arthur, let me change the subject um a little bit and for someone who has been in the industry for so long in such massive companies for so long working in so many um ips projects developing pipelines i'm sure you have funny anecdotes this question is it, it has a structure, right? But I just want you to ask if you could share something funny, unexpected, without breaking any MDAs, of course, <laughs> but something that really still makes you giggle to this day. Uh yeah, so let's see. Um I guess this one isn't a secret, but uh so back in the day uh we were working on diablo 3 and we had already shipped the pc version and we had decided to ship a console version um post launch um and that yeah, because it a took lot. a little longer yeah it took, it took it, and it required longer. a lot of changes to the ui and we had to add couch co-op 
and things like that to it. Um, and so um, it took about a year for us to get the console version out after the PC version. But don't quote me on that. It's been so long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, we were we were nearing the end of the release. We was getting close to to uh, tra submission time, and um, the designers had come up with this cool idea of creating a secret level um, where you can the cows level. <laughs> no, that 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 one was in the original PC version, but uh, it was a secret level you could access where uh, if you got in, you could kill all the people on the team. So all the all the developers uh on the team and um okay. they would have you know their names and then a, a title underneath of them and um um and so um i was i was one of the monsters that you could kill in there uh as with everybody else but um the title they ended up giving me was destroyer of dreams um oh. and it was sort of a funny tongue <laughs> tongue in uh cheek moment because as we sort of neared you know the console submission this was blizzard's first console console titles i want to say in 15 or 20 years or something like that um uh i had to more regularly tell them no you can't do that 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 would cause a lot of changes for us or no you can't do this thing and and um and so uh, that was the nickname I was dubbed. The Inside title. joke. <laughs> yeah, the Destroyer of Dreams. Um, it was a fun one. It, it, it uh, I, everybody laughed when we we saw it, but it was, it was. Apropos. Is that your bio on social media now? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. It but... should be. <laughs> I try and I anyway. try not to say no. Usually, I want to give designers and and UI people as much freedom as they can do. But you know, there comes a point in the project where you can't change everything anymore. Where we we need to ship things. So, uh, yeah, fun. That's hilarious. I love it. Um, I, I love thank it. you uh, so much for everything you you've shared um, so far and. Um, as the last question I wanted to ask you, looking back on your career, what's one piece of advice that you'd give to someone uh, aspiring to get into game localization? Um, so I, uh, so as I mentioned, I think one thing that often gets overlooked is understanding how, how everything works behind the scenes. Um, so one thing that I often encourage everybody that's worked for me is really sort of dig in and understand what happens when you push a button. What does that button actually do? Because um, it helps you troubleshoot things um, a lot when things break uh, unexpectedly. Um, if, if it breaks in a certain way, you can go, oh, it's because of X, Y, Z, and, and you can go in and either fix it yourself or tell whatever engineer you're working with, hey, it's broken in this location and we need to fix it. Um, really understanding how things work, um, I think is a undervalued skill set um, for anybody working in localization. That's, that's a really good advice and I've never like heard anyone even say it as well. So thank you for that. And So I wanna know Arthur, what are you playing at the moment? Uh, right now, I am in my fourth playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. Oh my god, same! I love yes! It. <laughs> yes! Um, I've played uh, the first time as a goody two-shoes paladin, um, and the second time I played as a, a Dark Urge character um, and went the full evil route, uh, which was... <laughs> Harder than you would think, not not in the sense of difficulty of the game, but actually pressing the evil options. Oh my god, yeah, I mean, Thada will be so proud decisions. of you. Like, yeah. I mean, Thada is trading for you right now. Oh, I hate it, her. <laughs> it's it's harder than you think it is, but um, but yeah, I I managed to pull that off, and then um, I think my current playthrough is I, I wanted to try a bard because those are it's not a class that is part of the companions that you can get so i just wanted to get a feel for what it plays like it is my uh, class yeah, I'm a bard. Like <laughs> yeah i love being a bard 
<laughs> so uh, go ahead. No, it's just it's really funny because it was the same thing we were doing. Uh, we're playing with my boyfriend, and I'm always like, no, we can't harm this person so we're always choosing and then he was like okay but then we have to start again and choose all the evil options so i will have to go through that pain very soon yeah yeah it's harder than you think uh because you feel bad um, yeah but but yeah it's fun it's a it's it's really interesting how different the game feels based on the choices you make they did a really good job um, um i don't know that i've played a game before where you know it Sort of doesn't matter what choice you pick, the game just keeps going forward. So if you just take yeah, too long to do something, usually. the game doesn't care, it just moves on and and um it's really interesting. Normally it's like you can just sort of wait until the right time to make decisions, but no, here it's just like, okay, you made this choice. You're just gonna factor that into everything that you do going forward and it's very interesting. It plays out surprisingly mm -hmm. differently. And Believe it or not, I have found things in the game on my fourth playthrough that I did not know existed. Uh, I somehow missed them in my first three three times around. Yeah, so I same. think that's really cool. That is so yeah, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the hardest part for me in the game is not to fall in love with Astarion because I love him so much. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm in my fourth playthrough and it's just like insane the amount of things I'm finding out. The fourth time I've played it. It's a so well deserved well deserved game of the year for sure. Yeah. In my opinion. So was on my Dark Urge playthrough I, I decided to romance Lazel. Um and it was it was fun because in my good playthrough she was probably the the sort of the meanest or most mm -hmm. you know reproachable character in the game yeah, and yes. and then in my evil playthrough she was the nicest. Uh, because everybody else was super mean, right? Like, you know, you, you get Shadowheart to go evil and you get Asterion to follow his quest line and become evil. And and so she was the nicest. <laughs> wow, that is so interesting. <laughs> I love it. Honestly, I would make this episode like three hours long, but <laughs> yeah. it's so great to, to hear you and all, all your... Um, kind of like wisdom that you you share with us uh, in this episode we really appreciate it and for everyone here and thank you so much um for all this season it's been a wild ride and yeah thank you for for listening thank you for having me thank thank you arthur thank hey. you everyone it's an honor it's a pleasure thank you so much bye 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 bye, -bye.